a track called Tyrant from, from Steve Kilby's solo album called Unearthed. It hasn't actually been released officially in the shops, but we've uh, managed to get Steve to come into the studio and to bring a test pressing along with him. Steve, thanks for coming in on a Saturday night. Thanks for having me. That uh, the, the album, when exactly will it be out, Unearthed? Um, at the very latest, it'll be out on the 19th. Um, hopefully, uh, if we can get the covers back and the records pressed before that, like as soon as they're delivered, they'll be in the shops. So that'll be next Friday at the earliest? Yeah, yeah. At the earliest? At the latest, the latest, yeah. Hopefully a bit before that. Oh, good. It's coming out on Red Eye, so I assume uh, John Foy's had a hand in That's right, yeah. the artwork and things. Yeah. Can you tell us what the cover's going to be like? Is it going to be one of his little extravaganza? Um, yeah, it's sort of... It, it's kind of psychedelic, I suppose, sort of with a purple turning into pink sky and I think I've got a green face and um, it's just sort of me grimacing into the sun while standing against a wrought iron gate somewhere in Centennial Park. Hmm. Well, you actually said it was similar to the photo that's in the... Uh, Christmas issue of Ram, yeah, something yeah. similar to that. Uh, they're all, yeah, they're all taken from the same session. Hmm. Why did you call the album Unearthed? We haven't had a chance to listen to it totally. Is there a track on the album called Unearthed? No. Um, well, see, originally there was going to be a book. Well, there is a book called Earthed, and the album was going to be Unearthed. And it was a, um, a crude marketing ploy to try and get people to buy the book and the album at the same time because, so they, so, because people like to get a match set. But um, the book took a bit longer than I thought getting together, and the album's come out before. Um, and the book was always always called Earthed, so I thought you know, it'd be neat if the album was called Unearthed. And it's also got the sort of connotations of um, you know, unearthing these old tapes from somewhere and putting them on an album. The album is a homemade album. Yeah. How is it homemade? Um... In the realest possible way, I've, I used to have a four track and recently updated to an eight track. And for about the last five, or well, for the last ten years, I've been making music at home, sort of like. So I've got a lot of tracks to sort of call back on, and so I, what I, I didn't have that many eight track tapes finished, so I had to supplement it with about four, four four track ta tapes that were left over, and uh, you know it was all just recorded at home, and I sort of engineered it uh, myself and played all the instruments bar a few things myself and um, you know it's sort of all just a cottage industry really yeah I was going to ask you you say you've more or less recorded all the instruments yourself on the on the recordings at home more or less yeah um, Russell my brother played um, bass and something, I've forgotten exactly what he played. He played bass and something else on one track that we did as an instrumental one after that. That's on the in a, in a bag, actually. Yeah, yeah you've written... <laughs> bass and something else. Bass and something, something else. else. <laughs> well, we, made, we, had, we had this synthesizer that was making these funny noises that it wasn't supposed to. And um, Russell, I think Russell was controlling that. And um, a friend of mine called Corin Janssen played... Um, guitar and some keyboards and did some singing and helped me write one of the tracks as well. But apart from that, it was still all me. How do you find that? How do you find recording and making music just totally by yourself? Do you think that's a good thing or do you think that it can have its uh, bad points about it? Uh, well, yeah, it is. I mean, both. I mean, both those things are true. Um, I mean, when you buy this album, you'll be hearing the music the way I intended it to be heard. I mean... You know, some people, some people think it's self-indulgent. Some people think that I'm not a very good guitarist or drum program, and some people think it's, you know, it's um, they'll like the rawness and the roughness of the whole thing. You know, um, depending how on how you approach it. It's basically I've just suffered this really terrible reaction from perf to perfection. Not that the church has ever sort of achieved or even attempted to achieve perfection but just sort of all everything you hear on the radio is kind of quantized and synthesized and smulchy and yeah and there's nothing real anymore and like this if nothing else this is a real album you know made by a real person sitting there in a bedroom in in sydney strumming guitars and singing out of tune and you know i listened to a lot of my favorite records and they were they were made the same way it wasn't all kind of sequenced and perfected. 
Mm. Do you think many people will pick it up radio wise and uh No. no. You, you know so you so you won't be disappointed if uh it doesn't get that much airplay. Uh, well, I'm hoping you guys and Triple J and equivalent stations in Australia and around the world will play it. Like, I think it'll, you know, it'll come out in America and, you know, it'll probably get played on, you know, some radio station in Minneapolis and somewhere in, you know, Tampa, Florida or something. But I don't think, I don't think sort of K-Rock's going to play it. I don't think Triple M's going to play it. And it was never intended for those people to play it. And the sort of people that listen to that station won't like it anyway. Hmm. So, you know, it's it'll find its own way home, I think. So it's not made to convert people in the slightest, it's just made for no. people who will enjoy. It's made for aficionados. Well, it wasn't made for anyone, actually. It was made for perhaps to play to the rest of the band, say, would you like to do this song? Or made simply going in and turning on my tape recorder and playing around until there was a song. And now it's intended for... Um, just for aficionados. Right. Have the church tried any of these songs on this album no. to do with the band? No. Mm. They don't like them or they're just um, they're not church style? Well, no. Well, um, we, we've got a new policy now where we're write, writing all the songs together. So that's kind of um, made all my songs I write on my own redundant, which is cool by me because now I can... Even if I never write an another song, if John Foy willing, we can put out albums from now until Doomsday. <laughs> <laughs> so really, the church from now on, are gonna, it's going to be a total collaboration between the members? Pretty much, yeah. Great. Yeah. Perhaps there'll be one song per album that I write or someone else writes. Or Like, we're hoping to do a double album uh, early next year. Maybe on that, you know, there'll be a few songs written by individuals. But I think mostly, I think the way it works best is if everyone w writes together. Right. We asked you to bring in your five favourite records that if you're stuck on a desert island you would bring in and you did say that you couldn't choose from your album so you just chose from your single mm. collection mm. and we're about to hear one now. Yeah, you've brought in some really, really interesting ones, especially this first one, Chris Bell. Yeah. Who is Chris Bell? Well, um, Stuart Coop actually turned me on to this record, which is the only decent thing he's ever done in his life as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, Hi, Stuart. <laughs> defamation suits coming up. No, um, Chris Bell was a guy who was in a group called Big Star, and he was on their first record and wrote and played a lot of the songs, which, which was number one record, which did absolutely nothing. They were a group from Memphis, and they were working in, the, in about 1972, 73, 74, when it wasn't very popular to sort of have jingle jangle guitars and stuff, when the whole world was sort of, you are either glam rock or heavy metal. And Chris Bell left Big Star, made this record, and promptly drove his car over a cliff and killed himself. This has actually got Alex Chilton on it, this record. Really? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful song. It's a, it's, the lyrics are great because the guy's sort of saying to himself, it's very, um, it's very philosophical, he's saying to himself, I am the cosmos. Every night I tell myself I am the cosmos, I am the, I am the wind. And then he says, but that doesn't get you back again. It sort of immediately brings it all back into focus, either, even though he realises that he's God and he's, he's eternal and pulsing through all matter, and etc., etc. It still sort of doesn't get his girlfriend back. I think that's it dovetails rather nicely. Mm. What year did he die? I think about 73. I'm not sure if it was suicide or an accident. Okay, well let's go into it. Chris Bell and I am the Cosmos. Speaking about poetry, um, I was interested to read in Ram that you, Steve, don't call your book of poetry poetry. No. Why? Um, oh, well, the people who've read bits of it don't call it poetry either because it's... Um, it's not, um, it's not verse, it's not, it doesn't rhyme, it doesn't have metre, it doesn't sort of obey or have any of the traditional characteristics of poetry, it's more like, it's really just prose. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, I mean, it sounds funny saying you're putting out a book of prose, uh, sort of, say, a book of poetry, but it isn't really poetry at all. What made you want to actually put it out? Um, I don't, I mean... Isn't it personal this, this, stuff? No, it, it isn't personal stuff at all. at all. No, this, I was talking to someone about this last night, and someone was saying, oh, it's personal, private stuff. And I said, no, it isn't personal, private stuff at all. It's, um, I actually wrote it to entertain people, much the same way as I'd write a song, to, for people to enjoy it, not, the sort of, not so they can um, pour over my agonised inner soul confessions or anything like that. It's actually written for people to enjoy. 
So that's why I'm putting it out. Mm -hmm. And also so I can go up to girls in nightclubs and say, <laughs> I've written a book of poetry. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect line. It is, it is, that is quite an interesting uh, fine line about why, why you do want to put something like that out in terms of your art, in terms of do you write it for other people to enjoy or is it more or less just a personal thing? It uh, must play on some people's minds, especially not only poetry but also music. Mm. as well well um no well i definitely do do it for other people to enjoy um i mean there's a vast difference this sort of you know people who who write poetry as a sort of a therapy for themselves about you know why they hate their father or you know how they'll never forget that maggie's left them and run off with the milkman and um you know how they'll never get over the fact that they're cross-eyed or whatever it is you know and um they sort of furtively scribble it down and you know Sometimes they get it out and show it to people, but mine isn't like that. Mine's more or less um, deliberately um, conceived um, for when people enjoy it. Hopefully, it'll um, you know they'll uh, same way you enjoy watching TV or listening to a record. You'll sort of when you read the book, you'll actually enjoy reading it, and I think people will. It sounds like a Victorian woman's diary. How they used to put everything in their diary, but knowing that one day they'd show everything to their husband to be. <laughs> hmm. Did they? <laughs> yeah. Seems a similar sort of thing, that it's all written so that one day you can actually give it to people. Oh, well, I, no, I, actually, well, I know I sat down and wrote this as a book that I was going to put out. Um, I had another book of poetry, which was poetry called The Crowd Invisible, which one day I might put out and one day I might not. And I was always very umming, umming and ahhing about it because I didn't think it was very good. But this, this book, Earth, I think is, um, you know, whether whether or not I'm a, someone in a band or whoever, I think it sort of will hold its own against... I don't think there's anyone doing anything like, like this sort of in these days. It's sort of uh, it's basically sort of surrealist slash psychedelic in its approach in that I sort of sit down and write whatever comes into my head. But I don't write it in a sort of a, a flowery, you know, sort of verses and things. I just sort of put it all down in block prose. Do you think poetry might come back into fashion soon? Can you sense it coming? Um, I think all, I think all the arts are going to die out, except sort of things to do with computers and videos and all of those things, because they're it gives people instant gratification, and that's what people want these days. Um, so I think poetry is going to, well, as it is dying out, is going to be the first to go. Um, I th it's never been a very popular art form, has it? Well, I mean, like in the last. Um, you know, since the 1950s or 60s, no, or not so. Not, yeah. No. Although there was uh, the 50s and 60s, the beat generation, there was uh, yeah. a lot of interest around yeah. there. I can sort of sense, just in Sydney alone, the rise in popularity of poetry. Like there's not only these writers in the Park series at the Harold Park mm. and also at the Palace Hotel, mm. but you got people like Stephen Herrick putting out singles of poetry, mm. and uh, there are a lot of young poets. Mm. That could be a fad. Yeah, you that's know, true. Like the in thing to go and see on a Monday or Tuesday night or whatever it is. More of a fad than an actual mm. phase. <laughs> none of it's, none of it's marvelous though. None of it's, um, none of it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? None of it takes that's you right out of yourself and blows your mind. Um, pro probably someone's gonna say, "Well, nor does your book kill me." <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried. A lot of it's just kind of pretty average day-to-day -day stuff and um, I've really tried to sort of do something that sort of um, you know it, it's different hmm. how are you getting it published I'm publishing it myself mm -hmm. from the profits of unearthed are you printing it <laughs> yeah yeah I'm oh, not me myself but I'm, I'm paying for it paying for it all to be done so, so it'll come out in an actual book and oh, it'll be a book it'll, it'll be, be a book, book with a laminated cover and pages and everything oh. I actually had visions of you sitting down with a silk screen or something and printing each page, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> binding it yourself. <laughs> how many copies? Selling them. How many copies I'm will be done? I'm start up? out with two thousand. Oh, good. Probably, probably mail order. I'm not. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it at this stage. I can't really see myself walking down to Dimmicks and saying, "Hey." You haven't heard of me, but do you want to have five copies of my book, and I'll come back next Wednesday and see if you've sold any. So I'm probably just going to have a post office box or something where you can write and get it all. Record shops, do you reckon? Maybe rec maybe Phantom and Red Iron. I, d I don't know. It'd be good, though, to get get them out away from that scene and try to attract 
people, yeah, that, well, that's who, what I want who to don't do. actually know you from the church. Yeah, and that's, that's the real challenge. Well, there's a lot of nice little bookshops around. Yeah. That in Glebe I would imagine and everywhere. would be fairly yeah. accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Feminist let's... bookshops. Let's, so. let's go into another track now. From Unearthed. Maybe a misogynist bookshop. You never know. <laughs> this one's called Heliopi- Heliopolis. Is that's that right? right? Yeah. When did you write this one? And oh, this is 82. Yeah. What's a it's Heliopolis? A Heliopolis is a city in Egypt. City of the sun. This mm. is continuing on from what we once talked about many months ago when Heyday came out about uh, your liking for things, um, ancient history. Oh, yeah. Ancient history related. Oh, my book. My book's riddled with Greek mythology. Is it? Yeah. Mm. Great. Okay, well, let's get into it now. From Steve Kilby's soon-to-be-released solo album called Unearthed. I actually went and saw the Dream Syndicate the other night at the Cardamom Cafe. You saw them over in... Steve, you saw them over in America when you were over there this year or last year? Oh, I think it was the first time I was there. For, uh, I think it was the first time... Testing, testing, check. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the first time I was there. The first time? Yeah. Yeah, what do you think of them? Don't like them much? Mm. Like a million and other... Yeah, I... I mean, that was a real up... Real boring old plod, that track, wasn't it? <laughs> I quite like it. <laughs> oh, it's not bad. I don't mind the album. Uh, Live, they were a bit disappointing. Yeah. Up at the Cardamom on Thursday night. More like a nightmare syndicate. Yeah, a bit like that. I don't know whether it was the Cardamom or whether it was actually mm. them. I don't know. The Cardamom doesn't seem to be a great place for bands to play in. It's a very low ceiling and yeah, yeah. it just seems the sound sort of doesn't do much. I used to hate playing there when it was Sergeant Peppers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's... Now that the Mansell's gone, though, it's... Uh, where do you go? Where do you go? <laughs> Down the road. Anyway, you're listening to The Electric Lounge on 2SER and in the studio. With us tonight is Steve Kilby. Had one thing we were going to ask you right at the beginning but didn't was that out of the church members, you're 90% of the time is, are the, uh, uh, is the person, <laughs> sorry, is the person, <laughs> is the person who does the interviews. Mm. How does that go down with the band and with you? Well, I'm not anymore, actually. Peter's been doing a lot. Peter's been doing a lot since we've been back. Um, I'm not really interested in doing interviews about the church anymore. Um, so, I I don't know, I, I'm probably the most eloquent of the lot, I suppose. They're, then I don't think anyone else was... Marty and Richard very rarely interested in talking about it. And Peter's kind of... Peter's been doing a lot of... Intri- interviews lately he's a lot more diplomatic and a lot more concise than I am and you know I'm quite happy to sort of turn the job over to him forever um but you know here I am doing my own beating my own drum so Hmm. couldn't be helped why don't you want to um talk about the church what's there to say (laughs) that you haven't said a million times before yeah what can I say I mean when a new album comes out okay and you go in and say this was this and we did this and so and so played this but I mean apart from that you know, talking about how was America and, you know, all the old questions. I just, I can't be, be sincere about it anymore, so I don't want to do it. On average, when an album comes out, say with the last album, Heyday, mm-hmm. on average, how, how many, many interviews, interviews would you have had to have done for the next two months for um, that album? Well, I've, I went around Australia and um, and probably did sort of in each major city on a, a day and probably did ten a day. And then I went to America and I spent four days in New York doing it an interview every 10 minutes, if not on the phone, then with someone. And then all, the, all around America, I would spend half my days doing interviews, just thousands and thousands and thousands. And I'm just, t- I'm all talked out now. I'm tired of it. Did it annoy you the, that uh, that came along as being part of a musician? No, I thought I'd like, that was what I was really looking forward to, getting a chance to kind of, talk about myself when I first started out I thought you know well this will be great but now I'm the novelty's well and truly worn off mm. of those interviews you did for Heyday what proportion were with idiots <laughs> well I was, I was <laughs> going to say that but then I thought better way to say it was with people that you would rather have not have been with at that time um half of them half of them yeah. so half of them are quite good and half I of normally them. find people in sort of the college radio stations community radio stations are people usually doing it for nothing or for very low wages and they're doing it because they like music and I usually find they're pretty cool and people from magazines are pretty cool the real pains of the sort of the KROQ type stations and the the daily papers 
people who don't know about the church and don't care about the church, just that Warner Brothers have hassled them into interviewing me. And they're sort of, you know, sort of saying, well, tell me how it all started. <laughs> yeah. They don't do any research, do they? No. They don't do one scrap of research. Or if they do, they um, they get an old bio and, it's, and they sort of say, it says here. You yeah. said back in 1978, yeah. you said, do you still agree with that? Mm. Yeah, it must be it must be, be a real pain in the A to have, yeah. to, to, have to do all the rounds and do the, the industry yeah, scene. Yeah, caused, you know, caused a bit of consternation overseas because we used to get to a stage where... Um, no one, everyone refused to do it in the band, and I'd refuse to do it, and everyone else would refuse to do it, and record company would be going crazy and say, someone's got to do it, and someone's been stood up, and if you stand him up, you'll never get your record played again, and, you know, oh, it's just, just a real pain. Do you mind being quoted about past things that you've said? No. Or would you rather forget about no. all those things? Not really. <laughs> well, I don't mind being quoted, but I, I reserve the right, was right to disown them if they're old and, you know. Yeah. I'm not about to quote you. Oh. <laughs> I remember one day I was listening to Triple J and George Wayne pulled out an interview from God knows when and played it. It was quite funny hearing it uh, several years down the track. So sometimes it yep. makes, makes for good radio and interesting listening, listening but whether it uh, pleases you or not is a different matter. People really change. I mean, normally you say something and no one's going to hold that, hold you to that five years later. I mean, if, if you're a beer swilling ochre, you can change and turn into a sort of a nice guy and vice versa and sort of a, no one gets worried about that metamorphosis but if you're in a group and you you know one day you come out and say oh, I hate this and I hate that and I like this and I like that and then next week or next this was one of the very first Australian singles I bought or when I when I started buying a lot of Australian music I picked this one out the lighthouse keepers and gargoyle mm. what uh, attracts you to this is it this the very um uh, what's the word? The very sort of unique sound or the pared down sound that you like about it? Um, yeah, I, I think just it's a wonderful, wonderful record and the singing is... I just love the whole song. It just does something to me and reminds me of a period of my life and I just love this song. I, I, in fact, I sort of harbour vague intentions of doing a version of it myself one day. But they, you know, probably someone who wrote it come out and say, didn't want him doing it, but, you know... Do you, really do you like often come across songs that you... Yeah, yeah, I do. I often come across. You don't do many, do you? No, I don't. Why? What pulls you back? I'd rather get the publishing royalties on my own ones. <laughs> Fair enough. Here's uh, Gargoyle by The Lighthouse Keepers. Guilty from Steve Kilby and Unearthed, his uh, solo album, which hopefully will be in the shops at the end of this week. That uh, synthesizer, that's not doesn't sound too, too bad. Uh, oh, the strings. I mean, sorry. I mean, <laughs> like I remember um, you were saying that you, on Heyday you just wanted to use real strings because yeah. you didn't like the the string mm. sounds that synthesizers mm. made. But yeah. that sounds uh, that sounds good. The, yeah. the way the synthesizers well, come I in there couldn't fit the twenty four piece string section into my into my front room. <laughs> yeah. So you know you have to work within your limitations. Talking of guilty, mm. we've got a little announcement to make. The Dan Johnson Band. Specifically, <clears throat> though, uh, no, sorry, Dan Johnson Band. They've lost about $6,000 worth of equipment that's been stolen. Uh, some of the things that have been stolen include a Les Paul Jr. 1957 guitar, which has a cherry wood finish and a double cutaway, a Roland guitar amp, a Roland effects unit, which contains seven boss pedals. They've also lost a black road case, which has Dragon and Robert Taylor printed on it, a PA amp and a PA mixer, Roland 250, that has black... Um, it's black with wooden sides and it has eight channels. So that's just some of the stuff which has gone missing. If you know anything about that, if uh, you remember seeing any of those um, uh, pieces of equipment in second-hand shops or around pawn shops lately, then it might be an idea to give Dan a ring on 303564 or Anne a ring on 331-4837. Those two numbers, 303564 and 331 Four eight three seven. Pretty unfortunate thing to happen. Six thousand dollars worth of gear getting pinched. Has that ever happened to the church on the road? Yeah, we've had we had Peter had one of his classic guitars stolen. Peter's had an amp stolen. We've had um, effects pedals stolen from front of gigs. Just someone reaching Just out. Just someone reached out and took them. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm surprised. Uh, we played a gig once in Melbourne and we were all standing in this marquee. It was at the Moomba Festival and there was a little hand coming under taking all the guitars out one by one and we ran around the front and there's this little guy standing there pulling all the guitars <laughs> under the edge of the tent. Oh, no. He was too greedy. If he'd just taken one or two, he would have gotten away with it. But he, was, he, he went for the lot. I'm surprised it doesn't happen a bit more. Yeah, well, it does. It, ha- it happens does a lot more uh, than you probably think. Probably hear about, too. Mm. Well, just lately, there's been Amazing Willamar Losers. Most of their stuff got knocked off, the Urban Grillers. Mm. And now the Dan Johnson Band. It's pretty bad. because, my, But they, I wonder if oh, all that stuff, I suppose, would have been insured. Oh, or, I hope, yeah. Yeah. But still, it doesn't replace uh, it. Certain guitar, like, you know, f- mixing desks and stuff, it's insured. It doesn't matter because you can update with something better. But, you know, like a 57 guitar, like, what would you do? I'd just, just be terrible is that yeah some of those u- antique things mm. anyway we uh, were talking a little bit uh, about your poetry a while back mm. what about influence wise poetry do you read a lot of poetry yourself yeah yeah have you always read a lot of poetry since yeah. um well since yeah since my sort of late teens yeah what era of poetry what era 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 um I have a I have a real sort of soft spot for the um, surrealist movement in France in the sort of twenties, um, sort of André Breton, um, um, and the people before that, the Polonaires and Baudelaires and Rambos and um, all those sort of people. But I like Dylan Thomas and. Um, um, I don't know, you know, mm. people like that. Just saying Rambo there, I had to laugh. It reminded me of a funny story once I heard of... Remember that article we read about the Y train? And he said, um, what poets have influenced you? And he said Rambo. And the and um, the interviewer went... <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> went on this, this great big paragraph going, you couldn't quite understand how this guy standing in front of him with a paisley mm. shirt and pointed boots could be influenced. He said, Rimbo. All right. Yeah, it's... um. Not many people get into poetry these days, in a big way, do they? Didn't we talk, say that before? Yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, in, in actual... Not no, they don't. Like, no. in going back, going back and uh, mm. reading about all those, mm. and, those poets and stuff. And yet, to me, uh, it's my favourite form of entertainment. I think um, to read a good book of poetry is probably the ultimate sort of art form, as far as I'm concerned. And those people, it's just like... Um, they just used everything. They just took everything they had and just threw it in all the time. It was never never linear. It was sort of past, present, future. Um, here, now, there, anywhere, everything, anything, all the time. And mm. it's sort of like, after a while it sort of um, starts digging a little hole in your brain and expanding and expanding. You've got all these marvellous scenarios going on inside your head, which is much better than going down and renting the latest Friday the 13th video and sitting home and watching it over a couple of bongs and a packet of popcorn. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a lot more lot more sort of work on your behalf, but um, I still think the human mind is the most sort of amazing entertainment machine and you get into poetry and um, get used to letting your own mind do the work and letting your own imagination work for you and uh, it's a lot better than sort of sitting there and just consuming, not thinking about it. Can you gauge how much something influences you in your working either poetry or lyric-wise or music-wise? Oh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's it's a hard thing checking up on yourself, um, you know, isn't it? I don't, yeah, I don't know. I've always wondered where the, the line is between just liking something and, and being influenced by something. Hmm. Um... I suppose if, I suppose you're influenced. I'm influenced by everything I read. I've, I'm, I mean, now I've sort of started writing, as sort of with a view to releasing this book and hopefully more books. I sort of everything I read, whether it's an, a blurb on the back of a cornflakes packet, I'm sort of looking at where the commas are and uses of words and um, you know things like that. So I mean, everything I read influences me, and everything I hear, everything I say. If I'm sitting on a bus and I hear a conversation going on in front of me. I often hear a phrase or and I sort of make a mental note of it or you know, put it in my little tape recorder. And I carried a little tape recorder around the world with me and just sort of all the time whenever I thought there was a vaguely interesting conversation going on, I'd pull it out and switch it on and sort of 
Try and get what it down. What they have thought of you? Oh, they didn't <laughs> know. Secret agent, the, kill me. It was in the top pocket. <laughs> got a good one of Richard in Madrid, but um, that one's strictly rated X. <laughs> <laughs> What's easier for, for you to write? Is it... Um, or which do you prefer writing? Do you prefer writing lyrics for songs or do you prefer writing prose poetry? Prose poetry. Lyrics for songs are a big drag because you've sort of got... You know, you just can't... Uh, lyrics for songs have to be linear to a certain extent. You can't just take off wherever you like. And you've got to make it... Well, you don't have to make it rhyme, but you have to make it... have. It has to have some kind of metre. And then you have to have some... Well, you don't have to, but a lot of songs sort of have choruses and things because that's the way the music's structured. And... Um, you know, you just can't sort of take off on a flight of fancy. And, like, lyrics are sort of... And then when you're working within lyrics, you know, you sort of have to... You know, you have to stay within a so certain genre, otherwise you sort of feel silly if you if you start getting too arty and wordy. You know, there's certain words you just can't use in a rock and roll song. Mm. You know, you sort of tend to stick to the monosyllabic grunts just because that's the sort of thing it is. When you write, do you actually write to uh, produce some sort of a feeling in, in what you've written or do you have that feeling inside of you and you try and get it down on paper? Both at the same time, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I have a sort of feeling, I have feelings that I want other people, I think that's what music and poetry is all about. You have a feeling that you want other people to feel because it makes you feel a certain special way and I think that um, basically what all art is about, this occurred to me the other day when I was having a trip actually, that all art is about is reassuring the other people in the world that, that you feel alone as well and that we all basically, we are all islands and we all feel very much alone and one of the greatest joys is to realise that someone else experiences a similar feeling to you. Um, now all the common feelings have been done of, you know, I miss my baby, we all know that one, and we all know, you know, I'm dressed up for Saturday night and I'm going to go out and drink a beer, and we all know how that feels. But it's harder and harder to, uh, to find feelings that you didn't think anyone else had experienced. And they're the things that I'm trying to go for now, sort of those rare and special feelings, try and get that over to other people. And when they when it connects and they thought, Either they think, I didn't think anyone ever thought that except me, or I've always thought that but no one's ever actually articulated it, then um, I think that's good art, or good poetry, or good lyrics, or good music. I guess art is really just a form of expressing yourself in the best possible way, in for, for yourself. Yeah. Do you think everyone should though? Like, I was thinking about this this afternoon when uh, we knew you were coming in and we were going to talk about your poetry, like, everyone has art inside their head, but only a few people can actually put it down on paper. Mm. Now, is there a need for everyone to sort of to try their best? I think there was something in the RAM article which more or less suggested that uh, everyone has a need to um, put their art down, get it out of their head and put it down in stone, more or less, for, uh, I don't know, for the world to see. Um, well... I think I think if you just jump into it head first at an advanced stage, you probably get frustrated because poetry, like painting, like photography, like anything, takes a lot of practice. And I've been writing poetry for like almost twenty years, and I think now I think I'm getting you know rather good at it. But the early stuff I wrote wrote was a load of old bollocks. Um, I think if people just like you know if you just say. Um, I'm going to be a musician and pick up a guitar or a drum kit, you'll get really frustrated. And I think, um, you know, I think if you ever were going to do something, you probably would be doing it from an early age. You know, I think if, I mean, a few people start doing things in their, you know, their 20s and 30s and 40s, but I think most people start whatever they're going to do sort of pretty early on in life. Um, I don't think there's a need for everyone to, I mean, some people just aren't talented. Uh, that's, I mean, they're not talented in, in an art, I mean, I can't fix a car. I think, and not being at all condescending, I think someone who can put a car together and, or someone who can fix a television or someone who can build a house is just as talented in their own way as someone who can write a book of poetry. Certainly in a mo lot more useful. Um, you know, writing a book of poetry doesn't get you anywhere. But, um, you know, if you can... I, I can't nail a hammer in straight. And I'd, 
I think people who can do things like that, you know, everyone's good at something and, uh, you know, this is what I think I'm good at and I don't think that's any better or any any worse than someone who's sort of talented in another direction. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty true. Okay, well, let's go into some more music. You actually did a stint with a band called The Subterraneans, but it was with James Griffin. Yeah. This is a, a different Subterraneans altogether. Yeah. What are we going to hear now? Well, this is a guy called Nick Kent, um, who was a writer for NME. I think was one of the best writers that rock music's ever seen. Um, and he put together a band called The Subterraneans. Uh, I think this is about 79, 1980, and released this one single. Um, Nick Kent lived with Chrissy Hine for a long time, and people might hear this and say it sounds a bit pretendery, but I think it could be a case of the chicken and the, and the egg here, like who was influencing who. Hmm. And uh, classic undiscovered single called My Flamingo. Pretty amazing stuff what some people say about Reagan, especially the young people. Everyone outside of America hates the guy, and uh, it seems that his strongest supporters are the young ones within America. Steve, you're actually... Well, was this the second or third time this year that you went to America? It was, well, we went there once in 84, and then we went there once this year, and then went away and came back again, so I don't know if that counts as two or three times. I will let you count as three. Oh, okay. What, um, what are your opinions on, on America as a place? Are you, do you look forward to going there? No. I'm, I'm disinterested in geography and politics, so I just go there and carry my own little world three feet around with me, in front of me, and behind me, and to the sides, and... I don't care who's in power and what's going on. Could you gauge any feelings uh, from the people that you talk to, the Americans that you might have met? Oh, look, America's like, you know, what's going on in Detroit's a lot different to what's going on in Los Angeles. It's a lot go different to what's going on in the middle of nowhere in Iowa or somewhere. It's just, you know, it's like saying going to Surrey Hills and going to Wagga Wagga, you know. People think differently all over the place, you know. There's people who hate him and people who like him and people like me don't care either way. Do you care much for politics in Australia? No. I think it was I think Paul Keating not putting his tax form in was a classic though. That that that, that got under my skin mm. as someone who sort of always seems to pay quite a hefty tax bill. Do you think you should have a responsibility though to know what um what might be happening in the country politically? Do you think if you want to? I know, but seeing that it's more or less a necessity in this country to vote, you have yeah, to vote. That's because if if they didn't, no one would. Because Australians are like that, aren't they? Probably governments would be getting in on five people. You know. Yeah. Um, I think everyone should look after themselves. I mean, it's an old Buddhist adage that if everyone just looked after themselves, the world would be perfect. If everyone just did the right thing themselves. You wouldn't need governments, and I just I hate the whole concept of governments. You know, I'm not an anarchist, but I just I hate I hate any you know all those isms, and <laughs> I think they're all as bad as each other, and nothing works. Society doesn't work at all the way it's set up, and it doesn't make any difference if it's Ronald Reagan, Bob Hawke, Gough Whitlam, Madoff, Hitler, or you know you know some are worse than others, but it's all I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. It seems ironic, though, that uh, it's the head of um, the government of a country, yet you get all the people saying, um, well, more or less the intelligent people saying, like, the intelligent people don't want to do it because it's such a terrible job. So and only idiots do the job. Well, then you get to, start, right. you get to start to wonder about, it. Is, is it working right? Is the whole no, system working right? No, yeah. yeah, it doesn't seem that way. Well, getting back to America, how did the band go this time around? Was there any major developments in your popularity over there or was it was kept pretty quiet over here no one really oh we heard we heard all the um all the what is it the dirt on the church touring overseas what was that oh just the reported problems and things like that i guess that was all that really came back yeah oh the split ups and the yeah and the leavings and stuff like that mm. but then again you know you don't know which way to take it or what to believe so well it seems by what you've been telling us tonight, that everything seems more or less fine again yeah. within the church, is it? Yeah, yeah. Solid as a rock. Well, what happened over in America then in terms... has You don't seem very impressed by... Well, I'm not impressed, I'm not impressed by um, the whole shtick, you know? But don't you care? Doesn't it... What About what? I care on the night it's happening and then I don't want to sort of run down the pub and tell my mates about it the next day, though. Mm. You know what I mean? It's... 
you know, we went over there and we played umpteen concerts, you know, how many was it? I don't know, 50, 60, all over America and Europe. And every night, you know, some nights there were a couple of thousand, some nights there were a couple of hundred, and most nights we got two encores and they thought we were great and came back and slapped our backs. And next day we got up and moved on. Why and do you tour? Why do I tour? Why does the band tour? Um, I mean, these are really deep philosophical questions putting me on the spot. It's a bit like... Well, you've, you know? you've made yourself be put on the spot in terms of what you said to us because it sort of opened up that it um, mean, mean, doesn't mean as much to you as it means to a lot of other bands to tour the States and to get popular over there. It seems that uh, well, they're you take it for money, look, aren't they? Well, well you look at it differently. Well, uh, yeah, but that's what I'm asking you. Is, are, are you doing it for the money sense? Do you want mass popularity? Do you, you know... Well, it was sort of, like, I don't think touring America is any much more of a big deal than going and touring Newcastle, you know? It's just people. So, so what if it's New York? Or if it's, you know, if it's London or, you know, there's nothing happening there. You go to London and New York and everyone says, geez, what's happening in Sydney? Geez, I'd love to go to Sydney and see Died Pretty. You mm -hmm. know, everyone thinks something's happening somewhere else and there's nothing happening anywhere. Really? You think that? I don't. Where, well, where's the scene, man? I've I think, been, looking, I've been I, all over the world and I haven't found it. Well, I think to a large extent the scene is very much here. Well, maybe it is. Well, there, therefore, I mean, even less reason why anyone should be interested in what's happening, at what what was like for the church playing in America. I had a lot more fun playing at the Tivoli the other night than I've ever had playing in America. I mean, that meant more to me and I felt like I was, you know, striking a blow for the cause doing that rather than playing to, you know... I mean, they're all people. I, it, I just don't, don't... Basically, the accents are different or the language is different. And apart from that, everyone wants the same thing. But Europe surely must be different in that you're just seeing so many uh, different cultures and so oh, the, all the, the different languages. What are we languages. talking about? Me as a tourist g going around a, a shop in Cologne or walking through a street in Oslo, or are we talking about me standing on stage playing oh, both. a gig? Both. Well, uh, well you know... Okay, well, you know, ask me about a specific place like, and I'll tell you about yeah, it. Yeah, but surely it's not just like um, playing somewhere in Europe isn't just um, playing to, you know, a whole lot of different people. Surely it must uh, be really weird, <laughs> to, for want of a better word. It's not just like playing up in Newcastle. It's not just playing like in the Tivoli. It... Well, I get more nervous about playing the Tivoli than I do about playing... Because they're like... They understand They're the English. people who know... Well, not just that. No, they're the people who sort of... I feel as if they're the people who sort of know me, whereas when I'm playing in Madrid or somewhere, you know, I, I really don't know what my attitude towards it is. I mean, when I get back, I just sort of want to forget it. And um, I think it's silly all these bands coming back from America saying, we did really well in the States. 50 stations picked up our single. We're getting high rotation on MTV and, you know, so what? Who mm. cares? Mm. Yeah. Uh, What's that noise? Oh, that, that noise, that's a wonderful little noise. That, that's our alarm system here at the station, which comes blaring through the announcer's headphones and everyone else's headphones in the whole station at about uh, 4,000 kilowatts and actually <laughs> deafens the announcer. And at this stage, the announcer has to work out what he's going to say when he has this beeping noise in his ear. Anyway, we're going to get... Does that mean that the station coordinator is listening in and, and the guest is talking too long and there's not <laughs> enough music happening? <laughs> yeah, he's, got, he's got this switch at home, or she's got this switch at home and says, get off the air. That's and what happens in America. It. I mean, you you know, someone rings, the, the station manager ring up and say, um, play more records and less talking. That's understandable we, over mm, there. Mm. We, or we, here even, I mean, yeah. I'm sure they do it. The listeners do it here. People, people who don't like the church are switching off in droves right right at this very moment as we're talking. But that's what public radio is all about. Getting people so. to switch off. <laughs> no, no, you're getting the, getting the rest of the community, those people who are interested... Anyway, let's go into some more music. We've got to squeeze it in bet before 12.30. I think we'll have to actually say goodbye now somehow. No, no, we'll come so? back in a sec. Here's Bill Nelson, another Ooh. track from uh, Steve Kilby. Bill Nelson. And uh, the second last choice from our guest on the lounge tonight, Steve Kilby. What actually is that uh, track called? And when did that come out? He and Sleep were brothers. That's actually on a double single that was never available on anything else. Um, came out in about, I think, 81, 82. Hmm. Are you a big record buyer? Mm, yeah, moderate, yeah. I'm a fair, you know. 
I go through splurges when I buy a lot. I, you know, go into EMI and get a lot of freebies. I was really pissed off today. I went in and um, I went out and bought Craftworks album, then looked on the back cover and it was on EMI. I got it for nothing. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, we're going to have to say goodbye. It's uh, time's bet us yet again. Margot with um, Women's Jukebox will be in shortly. Thanks for coming in. Actually, we're going to forego your last choice. We've run out of time yeah. and we've uh, decided to play another track from the new album, Unearthed Instead. But just tell the listeners what your final choice uh, would have was, been. Well, it was going to be John Fox Endlessly, off his off the double single Endlessly, but... Oh, well. John doesn't need the APRA money. <laughs> <laughs> you can let, let it go by this time. Can I just mention that on Tuesday night on the Australian Music Show at 10 o'clock, uh, the Deadly Hume will be coming in as well as the Persuaders. Great. Okay. Now we're going to go from Unearthed, another track. This one's called... My Birthday. My Birthday, the Moon Festival. It's yeah. a very short one. Very short. What can you tell Does, us about um, this one? Tell us a little bit about it before we hear it. Uh, it's got a bit of a poem in the middle, actually. A little bit of a poem. A poem? And, uh, it's pretty old. It was done on a four-track. Um, it's actually written about my birthday is the 13th of September, which is the Chinese Moon Festival. And I just sort of happened to notice that one day and sort of whipped out this little ditty. Great. Okay. I don't think we actually mentioned it earlier, but when do you expect to have the Earthed Book of Poetry book out? out? February. About February. Yeah. Okay, so if people are interested, more or less, keep an eye out in various magazines and stuff. If it's not yeah. going to be distributed in the shops, then you'll let them know where to get it from. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming in. Good luck okay. with um, the immediate future for you with the new album. And are you going to do, be doing any solo shows to promote this? There's a very vague possibility that I will, but um, who knows? Yeah. Okay. And good luck next year with the okay, church. Okay, thanks May heavens, and thanks for coming in, Steve. Thank you. We should just mention that next uh, for the next three weeks, Karen and I won't actually be here in person, but there will be, the Electric Lounge will still go over Christmas and the new year. It'll just be more or less the best ofs of uh, some of the guests that we've had in over the past eight or nine months. If you can get your act together, Kingsman. If I can get my act together this week and tape them all, yes, they'll, they'll be on for the next three or four weeks. So we'll see you early in uh, January. Let's go out with uh, Steve Kilby and From Unearthed. My birthday, the Moon Festival. 2SER is Sydney Educational Radio, a real alternative, 24 hours a day. Thank you.